Good afternoon and welcome to this market sentiment trading presentation by myself, Charlie Burton, in association with Tickmill. Before we go into the presentation itself, I have to go through a Tickmill's risk disclaimer like we always do because regulation is so important in the financial markets. And the disclaimer is that the, the material providing this information is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views and information and opinions expressed in the text belong solely to Charlie Burton and not to the author's employer, organization, committee or other group or individual or company. I am not employed by Tickmill, just so you know. High risk warning, CFDs are complex instruments and come with high risk of losing money rapidly due to leverage. 75% uh, and 74% of retail investor accounts lose money when trading CFDs with Tickmill UK and Tickmill Europe Lim Limited, respectfully. You should consider whether you understand how CFDs work and whether you can afford to take the high risk of losing your money. These are our regulatory warnings. OK, let's get into the presentation. We're going to go straight off with a trading story here from myself. So this trading story starts back in late 2016. And I'm going to show you a chart of the euro dollar here. So this presentation is going to be looking mostly at the dollar and the euro dollar being the biggest currency pair globally and also looking at stock indices. So this is just a straightforward monthly time frame chart of the euro dollar. And I've already circled that that period down there in 2017. So what had hap been happening is that the euro overall for years from after peaking back in 2008 had been in this general decline, which really accelerated through 2014 into uh, a, a short term bottom there in 2015. And then we fast forward into 2016 in this last couple of bars as we came down into the end of 2016 and into the beginning of 2017. So what was going on? Well, in that November, I distinctly remember delivering a presentation to a number of traders about this very pattern and what was going on in the market. Because what was happening at that time was that there was an extreme amount of bearishness towards the euro dollar pair. So um, market participants were looking for the euro dollar to go down to parity. So down to one, come back down to parity. And that was the, the talk of the town, so to speak, for months leading to this decline into the very end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. It was all about when is the euro going to go hit parity? And coupled with that, um, I did, delivered this presentation talking about how I would like the euro, funnily enough, to come down and breach these past lows here. And we're going to talk all about this in this presentation. And, and that I was short at that time going into the back end of 2016. But also that I was also looking for a reversal to come in at some point, whether we got down to parity and reversed or potentially even not. Um, so we're going to discuss that in a moment. Now, what was interesting at, during that time, I was being interviewed on a uh, tip TV over here in the UK uh, in the December as price had come down to new lows. And the interviewer was saying to me, Charlie, uh, when do you think the euro is going to get to parity? And every question that he was asking of, of me in relation to the dollar and the euro dollar was all about, obviously, the euro is going to go to, uh, to parity and that type of language. And when do you think it's going to go to parity? There was no, do you think it might get to parity, Charlie? It was, obviously, Charlie, the uh, uh, euro is going to get to parity. When do you think it might be? It, so the assumption from the financial interviewer was that the euro is going to go to parity. So again, on the back of a huge swathe of negative sentiment out there, even the financial interviewers were very much uh, in line with that negative sentiment. So I'm sitting there in this interview thinking, well, 
there's a you know there's a there's a lot of assumptions being made here maybe i need to be looking um at the other side of the coin and so i knew what was developing and what was developing and many of you will have already spotted this on this chart was there's this thing called a divergence down here now this is a straight MACD indicator down the bottom here and it's normal settings that your default settings which is any charting provider will have the default settings if you put an MACD indicator which is 12 26 and 9 that's the default settings so we had this divergence down here the blue line made a low down here with these lows and then when even though price made a new low here the blue line as you can see was making a much higher low so at that point, price has made new lows, but the MACD indicator is diverging with that. So that was, but that's on a monthly chart. How would you go and trade that on a monthly chart? Well, you don't. You do a combination of multiple time frame analysis. That was just the big picture analysis. And then I had to take that down to the smaller uh, picture. But the big picture was I knew we had these divergences building. But we still need to wait for a sign that the market may well turn. It's all very well us looking at it right now, years after the fact. How did we know that the market was going to turn? Well, the first thing is you don't know. No one knows. And that's why we use stop losses. But certainly the sentiment backdrop at that time was exceptional. Uh, it was very, very negative. So when you see extremes in sentiment, you have to look the other way. Because if everybody is short a market, who's left to short in order to keep the price moving south? And if everybody's short, it only takes just one person, so to speak, um, to be buying and to turn the market back around. So if everyone or if an extreme of particip market participants are short, it doesn't take a huge amount to turn it back around the other way. And that's the, the basis of extremes in, in market sentiment. So anyway, so we had that recipe there of extreme bearishness coming into the beginning of that year. But with I knew that we had this potential divergences sitting there uh, building on the monthly chart. Now, I'm, I can't wait for this to well, I could wait for this to all turn around and then get in somewhere over here once it's already been coming up for several months. But of course, as a trader, I'm going to go down to the smaller time frames and see if there's any reversal signs there on the smaller time frames. So if I now come to the daily chart of what was going on there. It was literally at the you know, the end of uh, December 2017, uh, sorry, 2016, and the beginning of January 2017 here where we bottomed. In fact, I'd actually got in down here um, because why? We had a divergence on the daily chart as well. So that was great. So we'd got that building divergence potential on the monthly at the time, but the daily was already divergent, diverging. So once I'd seen some price action coming up, once we'd seen that, then um, then I could use that. So I was actually in here with a stop below that low. Had a nice, it was started to have a nice run. What happened? Oh, it rolled over, stopped me out when it just spiked down into that low. I'm always very honest about what I do and very open and transparent about what I do as a trader. I'm a I'm a professional money manager. I have no vested interest in trying to uh, tell you all the trades that work out and, and ignore the ones that don't. So in actual fact, I'd already been long once and then it nicked me out and then reset when it bounced. So once it bounced, I was back in there with a stop below that low. And this trade ended up because of the extreme in market sentiment. I knew that market sentiment when you get extremes it doesn't work itself off in the space of a you know a week or two weeks so the potential combined with a big picture pattern on the monthly chart that divergence that was there on the monthly as well meant that i didn't have to treat this as just merely a trade based on the daily time frame and just hold it for a no nominal uh duration on the daily so in fact along with other analysis i was looking up as a t at a target around 114 and a half was in my 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 actual target it actually went you know, substantially higher than that but it didn't matter from a risk to reward perspective you can you can see 
if I was getting in down here with the stop down the low, that you can see that it was great risk reward. Plus, if any of you have seen any of my other webinars that I've done with TickMill, then uh, I add into trades as they go in my favor as well. So I build the position over time as well. So there's that addition there. Okay, so I've got a massive extreme in, in sentiment and I had uh, these divergences. Let's go on to the next um, slide now. So that's the first just snippet of a story there. What we now need to do is look at some other examples and how actually specifically you can go about doing it. I've just given some overall examples with that story from 2017 about just how bearish uh, the sentiment was. But how do we tangibly get hold of that? Well, let's carry on then. So we can actually look and see what hedge funds and large speculators uh, were doing at that time as well. So we knew that the news outlets were all talking about the financial news outlets were talking about the, the how the demise of the euro and the euro is going to go to parity and maybe lower. But what were the hedge funds and the large speculators doing? Well, in fact, they were adding to long positions. So the big specs that the hedge funds weren't doing what, funnily enough, the overall market sentiment was doing. And we can see this from looking at the commitment of traders reports. So the commitment of traders report, if for those of you that don't know what it is, it's information that's released from the CFTC every on a weekly basis, where, whereby large futures traders have to uh, register their trades. So and then that that data is released every Friday. And so we get to see the positioning of large speculators up until it's already it's always out of date by the time it's released on a Friday because it only gives you the data up until the close of business on Tuesday. But it doesn't matter. We can still use that as a general, uh, giving us a general overview of how they, large speculators, are positioned. One thing to mention at this stage is that sometimes you want to be following those large speculators. But just like sheep and just like retail traders, there are times when large speculators and hedge funds are wrong as well. And they get caught, caught offside. And I'm going to show you those, those occasions during this presentation as well. So firstly, let's go and now have a look at the COT data. So normally, we would, I, in order to get commitment of traders data, there's a nice website called tradingster.com forward slash COT. And that gives you a nice breakdown of the commitment of traders report and into a more simplistic fashion. And I'm going to go through that with you here today. Now, here is a screenshot to start off with just to show you what, what the positioning was like. So we're, we're talking about that 2017 low. The this is just gives a this is a weekly chart up here, so it's not very clear. But this is that low that I was just showing on my previous charts of that euro dollar. But as we can see, the the large speculators overall were far less short than they had been at the lows in 2015 here and then here as well when the market made another low in late 2015. And so and by the time we got to that beginning of 2017, when I was getting long, their positioning was heading north, not south. They weren't building short positions, were they? They were coming out of shorts overall and far less and less. With every week that passed, they were less short, as we can see from their uh, positioning chart here. So in this instance, I've got a market where we've got huge amount of bearishness towards the euro dollar, but looking at the commitment of traders report, they actually were doing the opposite. Plus, I've got technical reasons with divergences to, to also be getting long euro dollar. And that then created a nice backdrop for taking that, that long trade back in there in 2017. So I wanted to put that first together as that first story there in relation to you know marrying 
technical uh, charts and um, what you're seeing on a chart along with sentiment and then also getting the deriving the sentiment from what's going on with those large speculators and hedge funds. So when I was getting long down here, um, this is the monthly chart again, but when I was long down here, we knew, we now can see that those large speculators were also massively coming out of their prior short positions. And so I was long down, like I said, down in this zone down here and then ran it up into the, around the 114 uh, zone. So with add-ins and banking a bit of profit along the way. So that's our opener to market sentiment and starting to think about um, the what the press are doing and what the financial press are, uh, are saying, plus also what market participants are doing. And I'm not talking about retail traders in this presentation. This is about uh, the professionals out there. And like I've already said, it's a, a case of gauging when you think the professionals are, are right or wrong. Because sometimes when they are at, at absolute extremes in their positioning, usually that's when they're more likely to be wrong at a turn. So let's let's move on. So let's have a look at tradingstir.com first of all. So let me just see if I can bring that up. Can I just get a check that you can now see my the website here, tradingstir? Can I just, can I just confirm that you can see that? Just pop it into the chat box. Yep, great. Okay, thank you. So if you come to tradingstir.com forward slash cart, then this will come up with a uh, the web page like this. So what I tend, what I do is I'll always use the legacy reports, which is the more simplistic report. There is a secondary report, which is uh, which was introduced several years ago, which tries to break down the report into more component parts. In in simplistic terms, I tend to just look at the leg legacy. So if I want to have a look at, uh, for example, the positioning of the S&P traders, then I'll go to the E-mini uh, stock index, click on legacy, and then it will give me a huge amount of information. And I'm just going to quickly show you what you're looking at here. So when you first click on it, what we're interested in is the non-commercials. OK, the non-commercials are your hedge funds, HF, your hedge funds and your large speculators who have to report their positions. Commercials are essentially the brokers. So we're not interested in that what they're doing. They're just taking the, the opposite side of what the hedge funds are doing because they're facilitating their trades. So I'm not interested in what the commercials are doing. I'm not interested in re non-reportables either. I'm only interested in the non-commercials, which is your, which are, who are your, your large speculators in the market. So what happened last week, what I'm interested in is the changes down here. So what happened last week is that we can see that long positionings increased by 27,000 contracts and short positioning increased by nearly 36,000 contracts. So although there were increases in both longs and shorts last week on a net basis, that means that overall they're more net short last week than long. So if I now scroll down, I'm not too interested in these bar charts. You can look at those. What I'm interested in this first chart here, which is that net positions. Now, when you come to this, it's got three lines on here. I'm not interested in the commercials, the com and I'm certainly not interested in the non-reportables. Non so if you just click on that, it will get rid of the non-reportables. The commercials are just the opposite of the non-commercials, which is our hedge funds. So we might as well just click on commercials. So we just have the blue line on here. Now, like I've just said, they increased their net their short positions by 35,000 contracts last week, as opposed to only 27,000 longs. So net net, it brought their their overall net net positioning down a little bit last week. And so that's what we see here. OK, so that's all I'm showing you at the moment is just the basics of this. If you want to come into it, you can come down and there's other you can actually break down and look at the just the longs only and just the shorts only. I don't even bother myself. I'm only interested really is the, in the net positioning. 
and then you can scroll out so I, this it defaults to a one year zoom you can scroll out to max which will give you the best part of 10 years worth of data and then you can see well where are we where are we right now relative to historical positioning and there are times when the large speculators are at extremes in positioning and we're going to be talking about that because that actually happened in the S&P uh, just this year just literally just a few months ago and as you can see they were at absolute massive short positions just a few months ago so we're going to delve into that in just a moment so we're either looking at extremes in positioning are they at new extreme highs or new extreme lows or is their activity diverging from what is going on on the chart a bit like like i just showed with that euro dollar back from 2017 so you can have a play with it you can change your zoom you can you've got a scroll here and you can change your zoom so you can have a look as much or as little data as you want and it's a useful site it takes time to get used to seeing the patterns within it but um, that's what generally i'm looking for is either divergences in their behavior relative to the price or they're at extremes because sometimes when they're at extremes they, they can be on the wrong side of the market collectively oops uh, that's that right now let's go back to the slideshow so we can now look at more sentiment examples using cot data so let's go and do that right now now i'm giving you an example here from uh, for the euro dollar a lot of the time i'm trading the euro dollar because it is the biggest currency pair uh, globally uh, the most liquid and so essentially you're trading uh, when you're trading the euro dollar you, you are trading the dollar uh, index in the main because the euro makes up something like 56 percent of the entire basket of the dollar index is the euro and then the rest is made up with, with you know pound sterling and uh, japanese yen and 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 several of the other major currencies. So I, I like to trade the largest currency pair, but I do trade other currency pairs, of course, as well. But from a sentiment perspective and looking at what the big players are doing, then I quite like looking at the euro and the dollar and the S&P futures contract. So back in 2020, the euro dollar had a great run. We had COVID back here. So this is, this is on a weekly time frame here. So all the volatility during that early stages of COVID. And then the euro started to push upwards here. And it ended up having quite a nice run through that year, it ran up into the summer. This was the July and August period up here, pulled back a little bit into August, September, and then carried on rallying into the end of the year, literally into the December of that year. <clears throat> now, what was interesting... Uh, as we came into December was what sentiment because at that point funny enough what were Reuters and Bloomberg and some of the financial media talking about there were headlines at that time I was reading in in Reuters um, saying uh, 2021 the demise of the dollar i.e they they were the reporters were talking about the likes of the euro continuing higher the demise of the dollar in 2021 they were talking about and this was right at the end of 2020 so again that gives us warning flags when we start to see headline articles talking about the demise of the dollar um we need to start looking the other way uh fairbod yes it's been recorded yes so we need to be able to start looking the other way. And like with that early, ex that first example I gave of the euro dollar, we have divergences the other way around now. So this time we've got this peak here and then we've made a higher high over here. And yet we're now making a lower high here on the MACD signal line. So we've now got, again, a divergence. So then you wait for price to come down off of that high and then that's where the trading opportunity comes in but that's on a weekly chart was there an opportunity maybe again like that example i gave earlier on coming down to the smaller time frame as well so at the moment again we've got from a sentiment perspective lots of basically euro dollar bullishness amongst the financial media 
and dollar itself bearishness uh, at a time when the euros already had a really good run. So could it continue extending that run? Yes, it could do. But when sentiment gets frothy, we have to look the other way because now who's left to buy if everyone's already long? And we've got divergences here as well. In fact, uh, if we have a look at the positioning now from a COP perspective, so now zoomed in to the that COP data, then what was going on there? Well, the euro topped out at the end of 2020, but the large speculators hit an extreme. And this was a historical extreme in their positioning. Back in the August, at the end of August, beginning of September, they topped out in their in their long con in the amount of long contracts they had so again as the euro carried on making new highs into the end of the year they weren't in their positioning they weren't making new highs into the end of the year so again we'd already had an extreme in positioning in long long positions and then we had divergences between what the large speculators were doing they weren't as long even though price had gone higher they weren't increasing their long positions. In fact, they'd reduced their exposure, coupled with Reuters articles and the likes, which were uber bullish, the euro dollar, which gives us a warning signal. If they're all, if the journalists are all um, uber bullish, we've got to look the other way. And then coupled with that, technical divergences on the price chart. So coming back to that weekly chart, we had these divergences here. And I was trading trading this with my members um, down down to here, actually, uh, just down to the black moving average, which is a 50 period moving average. But that's on a weekly chart. That's about a 500 pips in total run. So it's a great run overall. Um, it's probably a bit more than that top absolute top to bottom. But it's a great run overall. If I take you to a daily chart, then you can see. And in fact, what was going on in the daily chart? Yep, up here, we were diverging. So in fact, although we had the building divergence on the weekly, I could get in based on the daily divergences that were taking place. And in fact, there were actually divergences on the four hour chart at that time as well. This same pattern of divergences as price making new highs and the MACD not confirming there. So once its price has come off, so once we get a red bar like that, then I can then start looking at uh, entering to the short side. And then because of that weekly divergence, I could then trade all the way down um, and really try and milk this trade um, as much as I could. And the, the irony was I did come out right near the, the lows because I was targeting that weekly 50 for the for that from that divergence but again the recipe is there what what's going on generally in the media are there any extremes in sentiment amongst the large speculator hedge fund community and coupled with divergences on the price chart now so far what i'm showing you is our reversals but there i've also got an example when we've got a continuation pattern um, to be used as well and ah perfect timing we're going over to stock indices and like i've already said at the beginning of today's presentation are the large speculators always right? <laughs> They're not. They're not always right. Like I said, when they get to extremes, um, sometimes um, they're on the wrong side. So as I've already shown you, this big extreme in positioning that happened just this year, right down into just May of this year, they were massively net short. As you can see, it's their largest short position that they've had in 10 years, 10 years worth of data. And actually, I had more data going back to 2007. And it was the biggest short position that they've had since 2000 and going all the way back to 2007. So it was a real extreme in their positioning there. Now, one or two things is going to happen. They're either right. <laughs> and yes, there's a massive market collapse coming. <laughs> or they're, they're going to get caught on the wrong side. So let's now couple this positioning up with what was actually going on in the S&P at that time. So this is the daily chart of the S&P. Here's May. 
when they were reaching that massive extreme in short positioning. So they were massively short, but the S&P had been going up, generally speaking, since what, October of last year. So they were just continuing to build their shorts on this big on this rally that had been going that had started in October of last year and they were just increasing their short positioning now they could have been right but we have to couple it up with what's going on on the charts well if we look at the this horizontal line i have on my chart here we can see that the s&p just kept on bobbing its bobbing itself up against this horizontal resistance level around 41.50. And so by the time we're getting into May, the, you just go with the price action. So if the price action breaks out like it was over here, then it could well be that those large speculators and hedge funds are going to get caught on the wrong side. If they get, if they get tr even more caught because the S&P starts breaking out of this long run resistance, they're going to have to start covering their shorts. They start covering their shorts, it adds fuel to the rally. And that's exactly what happened just a few months ago, um, which helped, um, no, I'm sure, no doubt, uh, propel the market higher because they got caught massively short at the wrong time. So don't always think that hedge funds are right. Sometimes when they're at an absolute extreme, um, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll be on the wrong side of the market and the market then look for reversals. It just so happens that the market wasn't in a reversal as such. It was in a continuation pattern consolidating here. And then we got into, uh, into May and then we were just waiting for the breakout and, uh, and they were caught on the wrong side. Could they have been right? Absolutely. And therefore, we could have ended up with a fake out move where it faked out and then ended up uh, rolling over and collapsing. So yes, that is a potential, but you've got to read what's going on on the price action at that point and say, well, we keep on uh, banging our head against this ceiling here. Well, yes, it could be a fake out move, but with all those hedge funds that are massively net short there is the risk of a short covering rally and therefore there's your opportunity in this zone over here as price breaks out okay so look for both divergences and extremes in hedge fund positioning combine it with technical chart divergences like in my first couple of examples there but also breakouts on a price chart like i've just shown you there in relation to the S&P. But what about other forms of sentiment? So let's now go through another example here using sentiment. So we're going to use COT data again, but also other forms of sentiment, like I've already alluded to in today's presentation. How are we doing for time? Right, good. So I'm now taking the euro dollar from last year as we declined through, which started in well, that high, well, if only I'd have held on to my short from back here, hey, because I I shorted up here, remember, in the end of 2021 and ran it down to that weekly 50, if only. <laughs> but that was a good enough trade. I was okay with that. Um, carried on, started shorting again in the late uh, October time of 2021 is when I got um, properly short uh, euro dollar again. Anyway, that's not the that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here now is that we fell throughout 21 and into 22. And then we made this low down here on the 28th of September of last year. So what was going on from a sentiment perspective? So yes, okay, we've made a low, but there's no technical divergences down here. This is on a weekly time frame chart. What other information have we got? Because is there, was there any reasons why I could have got long down in this zone when we were reaching a sentiment extreme. Well, what was that sentiment extreme? Well, here it is. Look at this. Headline magazine cover on Bloomberg. Can't stop, won't stop. The Fed has turned the US dollar into a wrecking ball and there's no end in sight to the carnage. Yet again, 
the financial media have this amazing ability to time the market in the wrong way. <laughs> when, when you see when you see uh, uh, examples like this, you think, wow, I've got to look the other way. Because what they're talking about now is, ah, well, they've turned the dollar into a wrecking ball. So they're now uber bullish the dollar. So if we go back to, there we are, uh, go back to the euro dollar at that point, And that article came out down here, right down here near the lows. Um, and they were talking essentially about the euro dollar carrying on coming lower because they're talking about the strength of the dollar itself and so therefore the euro dollar coming lower and yet it was only back up here they were talking about the demise of the dollar and that they thought that the dollar was going to go higher they have this amazing ability they are just you have to remember they are just journalists at the end of the day they're not traders and so they get caught up in the sentiment uh, overall at, it's amazing how it happens but it does just like uh, retail investors and traders around the world will do. So we had this beautiful example of a falling euro dollar for a sustainable period. Um, and then that sentiment, as I've just said there, and it wasn't just Bloomberg, there were other articles out as well. So um, what was going on on the daily chart? Well, OK, um, on the daily chart, at that low, we also had a massive reversal day and i remember this day very well i was do delivering a presentation in the city in london to a group of uh traders for a bank and um this was a us cpi day so it was their inflation report and what was fascinating about this day is that coming into it you can see that the euro dollar had been uh, in the decline and on that day the CPI data out of the US came out red hot. So you would think, oh, super high inflation at that point in September of last year. You can go back and dig back through and find the, the CPI report on that day. It was a massive beat above market expectations. And so the euro st dollar started selling off on the back of that, that news. And yet, as we can see, the euro ended up reversing on the day. So, in fact, we've had news which should have sent this market lower, but it didn't. We ended up with not only a reversal, but a key reversal as well, whereby the, the price bar completely enveloped the previous day's uh, range and, in fact, the day before so it made a new low for the entire move and then closed above the previous day high so a complete com um, key reversal day as well on the back of news which should have sent it lower so we've now building a picture here that we've got massively bearish sentiment in the financial press a market that's been coming down for a long time so again lots of bearishness out there and then we go and get a reversal on news which should have sent the market lower. So coming back to what I said earlier on, there are times when if everybody's short, who's left to keep sending it lower? And if you go and get a news report like that, which should have done, and it doesn't, we have to sit up and, and pay attention. And that's what happened down there. Now, let's actually put even more technicals onto this. So we've got that reversal bar, but what was also going on coming back out to the big picture? Well, from a sentiment perspective, again, coming back to the COT report, and if we uh, come down to um, where we were at that point in 2022, so it was late September, so here, again, we can see that the large speculators had started getting what? Long euro dollar, well ahead of that event that took place in late uh, September on the 28th of September um, of um, of last year. So again, giving us a little bit of a heads up warning that the large speculators, oh, what are they up to? As price is coming down, they're not going with it. They're actually doing the opposite. So again, useful information there from the COP report. Plus, from a technical perspective, I've now gone out to a monthly chart here. What had the euro done? So this is now zoomed right out to that that same low. And we can see that that low 
corresponds to the high of the euro dollar in the year of its birth when it actually started officially trading in 2001 so that high met up with this low um, which was around about 0.96 on the chart and also correspondingly back to this low when it was just this is just the composite back here because the euro didn't exist uh, back in 1989 it was the composite of the german mark in its day and the french franc uh, among others so this low back here as well so technically the euro had come down to a technical level we got massive bearish sentiment looking at headline news articles and the likes plus we've now got that cot data telling us that the hedge funds weren't following it and they'd started turning. Plus, we've got a key reversal day on a major inflation event, which should have pushed the euro dollar lower and it didn't. It reversed and gave us a key reversal day. You put it all together and you say, OK, I've got to go long. Now, does it mean that? Oh, I'll go back. Um, does it mean that? It's easy. I'm showing you historical examples. And by the way, every single one of these trades I have taken um, with my community, um, uh, including the one I got stopped out on, like I said, back in 2017. Um, but it doesn't make it easy when you're, if I go back here, on that day, I was long that following day, following the key reversal day, I got long down here. And in fact, we we were I got long. Uh, we had a nice. It started running quite nicely, so I moved my stop up, and then it came over and actually did stop me out. I had to then get back in. Actually, in early November, I got back in after non-farm payrolls on this day. You still knowing all of that information that was in the background. So there you go. So it wasn't perfect in the end. I had to then have another other attempts at getting long. I might have got long through here as well, actually, because I add to my positions. So, but does it make it? any easier because as human beings we have this natural flight or fight response and we don't like um going against the the overall sentiment most of the time if it's really bearish out there you don't it doesn't always feel good in your gut in your stomach but sometimes when your stomach feels uneasy some of those end up being the best trades but it does, what I'm trying to say is it's not easy. And that's why we have to put all of this analysis together, plan our trades out in advance so that when the setup does eventually come, that we're OK with taking it because we've already worked it through from a mindset perspective because they're not always easy from a psychology perspective, which is why trader mindset, trader psychology is more important than almost anything. You can have all the information, but if you then don't take the trade because your mindset isn't prepared for it you're too scared to take the trade or uncertain then you miss out so i spend an inordinate amount of time talking to traders about uh trader psychology because that's more important than any technical setups or even what we're talking about here today because you can have all those ingredients but if your psychology isn't there then you're still not going to make money from it and so even for me even after 25 years of trading um you know, when I take a trade down there, it still doesn't feel, you know, it's, at the time, it still doesn't feel easy, but I can use that. I can use that, that pit of my stomach feel to think, hmm, this doesn't feel comfortable. I'm coming outside of my comfort zone. I've got all these ingredients here, but of course, the, the trend has been down for such a long period of time. And uh, that's sometimes a good sign, but you still got to put the trade on and you still got to run with it and hold on to that trade as well. OK. I'll just flick back through to the summary now. So in summary, using the COT report for divergences and extremes in hedge fund um, positioning is really, really useful. Combine that with technical divergences like I've shown you there today on the price chart uh, using just something as simple as a, an MACD. You could use an RSI for if you like RSIs for divergences as well so you're combining information there that to get high risk reward profile trades because if you're getting in after a divergence or like that last example where it was a key reversal um, bar um, into that support then you do get those high risk rewards because it's unlikely like I said at the beginning that when you've got those extremes in sentiment overall 
the the market's just going to bounce for a week and then come straight back off. So um, they do have decent risk reward profiles. And when extremes in sentiment such as that last year, um, the odds favor that larger move in price. Now, as always, we're limited on time um, with regards to how much detail I can go into in a presentation, but I do hope today's presentation has been thought provoking for you. And by all means, I um, welcome any questions at this stage. Um, right, so there is a question here. Are there any good observable examples with lower time frames? Yes, there are. So if I uh, far bod, if I go back um let me bring up a chart here of the euro um you remember i was talking about uh 2021 so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go back to a i think it was a four hour chart go to 2021 not 1987 there so let's um change that well, it was, it was the end of 2020, wasn't it? So um, let's see if I can, uh, where are we there? That's August, 2020. Right, okay. There we go. Now, Farbod, you know, I said that I traded off the daily and the weekly charts, but uh, during the presentation, when we came into that December of 2020 going into 2021, and I said there were actually divergences on the four hour chart as well. Look at the four hour, Look at the highs that were being made and look at the lower peaks in the MACD through that as well. So again, we can apply the same principles time and time again, very often. Uh, and that's what I was actually trading off, that, the four-hour chart. Now I'll take you back to what that was looking like on the daily chart again, just for your the purpose of this. Take it back to the dailies. Uh, where are we? 2020. There we are. That's where that was. I've just magnified that in when I just showed you that four hour time frame there. And that's what that was. And so I was short right up here based on the four hour. But knowing we had divergences building on the weekly chart and the and the daily chart as well. And so and then. So, yeah, very often you can use multiple time frame analysis, seeing that there's a bigger picture divergence or. Uh, major support or resistance coming into play and then saying, well, what is going on on an eight hour chart or a four hour chart or um, or even a two hour chart? Um, and if there's a, a good pattern, a solid pattern like there was back there, then yes, you can use that. And like that very first example that I showed today, if I go back to the 2017 example, um, you know, when I got long on that trade back down here in 2017 off the daily diversions, in fact, there were four hour divergences down there. You can go and check that out for yourself as well. Right down at those lows, there were four hour divergences. So I was actually knowing full well we had the daily divergences, but I was actually it was the four hour divergences were enabling me to start to accumulate my position that little bit earlier. So, yeah, not always. It's not always going to be there. But um, but there's a couple of examples where absolutely it was. OK, uh, Jazz. Hi, Jazz. Uh, forgot how good you were. Oh, <laughs> been too long since you logged into one of these. That's very kind, Jazz. Uh, have we got any other questions? But yeah, very kind of you, Jazz. There, um, Jazz, you posted that to hosts and panelists. People will think I've just made that up. No one else can see your comment there. <laughs> but thank you anyway. <laughs> exactly, Farbod. Yeah, so Jazz has put that on. And I think Jazz needs to repost that to everyone because otherwise people will think, has Charlie just made that up? <laughs> but uh, nice to see you, Jazz. Um, okay, any other questions? Any other questions at this stage? We've still got um, several minutes if we want to for any other questions. I do hope that, the, like I've said, that there's some food for thought there from today's uh, presentation. This type of trading isn't going to, and using extremes in sentiment, isn't going to give you trades you know, five times a day or, 
or even once a week for that matter. These are when we get these big picture extremes in sentiment, but they're good to have in your kit bag for when, when they do come along periodically. And so, you know, I wouldn't expect an extreme in sentiment in relation to the S&P to happen for quite some time, you know, um, but they will emerge or divergences in what, in the sentiment, within that cop report do appear so uh, it's really useful and i think it's something that uh, if people aren't currently using it you might find a way to incorporate it in your particular style as well uh smail uh, is asking is it still relevant to use sentiment trading techniques if you are day trading? Um, well, yeah, it's a good question. If you're day trading, no, what I'm showing today is not really relevant to day trading. But if you are day trading, Smail, then you certainly can have a look in the short term about what about what retail traders are doing, for example. So you can have a look at the typical sites to see when retail traders are extreme extreme positions like longs or shorts or whether they're, if they're on the wrong side of the market which they tend to be so you can have a look at that and incorporate that into your very short term trading so on a day to day basis the sort of stuff that i'm showing today is going to be less not really relevant to you smell but certainly for shorter term traders then do have a look at what retail traders are doing. Mo lots of um, sites out there which will show you uh, retail trader positioning. Uh, in the main, do remember that the majority of retail traders around the world are wrong uh, most of the time. Not all of them, but uh, a good percentage of them are. And so if we see a high percentage of uh, retail traders are short a market, well, it may well mean that market's going to continue going up because they tend to have this amazing ability of going short when a market's going up and going long when a market's going down. Uh, Keegan, do you only use TradingView or do you use MetaTrader as well? You see MACD indicator looks a bit different. Yes, um, Keegan, no, I don't use MetaTrader. I know it's a free uh, uh, charting service but as I always say you get what you pay for and that is free it's good it's good enough but the funny enough the standard MACD indicator that's built into uh, um, MetaTrader is incorrect Keegan so don't use the standard one you need to find one that's been properly programmed to put into it so um I do have one, but I wouldn't know. You'd need to get in touch with me via my PA. Come to my website, charliebirdentrading.com. Get in touch with, uh, use the contact form, and um, my my uh, Sam, my my manager, she will she can send you that indicator. Just say, have you got Charlie's MACD indicator for the um, for MetaTrader, and she will send that to you. Uh, so no, TradingView is so much better than uh, the MetaTrader. MetaTrader is quite basic. Trading, TradingView is a brilliant platform. Do you have any thoughts on why the daily weekly bullish channel just failed on the euro dollar? Um, uh, let's have a look. Um, well, I don't know uh, if it's overly failed just yet, um, but I'll put it on. Uh, let me just zoom out a, a little bit here. So I'm assuming that what you're referring to is this channel that looks a little bit like that. Yes. Who's um, asked that? Uh, anyway, um, there's a lot of co comments coming through there. Yep. Yeah, Farbod, you're saying yes. Uh, have I got, let me just go back to the question. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on why the daily and weekly bullish channel has failed? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Funnily enough, I do. Um, the, I mean, it has failed at the moment. Today, the euro is bouncing a bit, as we as we can see today. But yes, it's failed that channel there. I'm going to take that channel line back off now. Otherwise, there's too much going on the chart. But um, why do I think it's failed? Well, because... Uh, the dollar is on a tear at the moment. It's quite obvious in that regard. That's, a, that's not a really helpful answer to you, is it? But the bottom line is, 
that the eurozone is you know if you look at the the key driver of the eurozone economy germany germany's in recession the pmis out of germany have really been quite poor and so if you are comparing the eurozone versus the us right now especially on rate interest rate differentials as well um, the us is going to attract more more money into it or the dollar will do than the euro will do so um, even though it looks like the Federal Reserve are possibly, you know, have uh, peaked in their interest rate hiking cycle, uh, the ECB, although it's still looking like they may raise a quarter of a point this month, um, there's lots of talk that will that even happen? And it, but if it does happen, that's possibly quite possibly their last hike as well. So then it comes back to the table as to where would you rather park your money? You've got Germany, which is, like we say, is in recession at the moment. Um, and although the US is cooling slightly, it's still in a much better position. So um, hence why we're seeing um, the dollar benefit um, across the board at the moment. OK, um, I'll come to some of the other questions. Uh, smile good thanks again for your work you really appreciate it. oh thank you that's very kind of you to say your videos uh adnan your videos have been very helpful especially on mindset keep going thank you <laughs> keep going oh i've been doing it for 20 years adnan on the uh, ever since youtube came out so yeah um could you give some perspective on how professionals use indicators in their trading um that would have to be an entirely different webinar uh really adnan um how much do you recommend for stop loss percentage or pips good question uh uh limond um it depends on the strategy that you're using as far as how much should you use as a, as a stop loss should you use um, a pips based stop loss um uh, is what you're asking i do a lot of the time i put my stop losses below a, low, a, a previous low or above a previous high. I don't care that markets might come back up to it or back down to it. I don't really care about that. If I, if I get nicked out and it turns back around again, I can always get back in. So in the main, um, I place my stops below technical levels or even below moving averages or something like that. But um, you could use an average true range and, and do it that way. Um, but... Um, but that would be my answer. But it does vary from entry to entry. Sometimes I'll have a stop right at a low. Let's say I wanted to be long here today, for example. I might have a stop right below that low. But on another occasion, so I might, I might want to give it a little bit more room, um, uh, a little bit more slack. So it's not a one size fits all, unfortunately. But in the main, I tend to place my stops but either above a, a prior high, uh, if I'm looking to short or below a, a prior low, if I'm looking to get long. Uh, what's the email? It's not an email. It's just my website address. It's charlieburtontrading.com. And you can, th there'll be a contact form on there and you can ask on there, Vin. Um, okay. What particular day we're going to visit the COP changes during our trading is it weekly monthly uh, uh how to use that does it similar to forex right okay i was trying to understand your um sentence there yeah um the the cot data is released on a friday evening so really from a saturday onwards you're going to get that latest cot data so the current so we're looking at this and it's uh wednesday lunchtime so this current uh data is from really it's a week old um but we won't get the updated data until friday night okay um so you'll get the updated latest week um on friday night but it will still all be already be out of date once you get to friday night because like i said earlier on they only give the data up until um tuesday night's um trading but it doesn't matter. You don't need it as a timing tool. It's about seeing overall what their positioning is like. And so, yes, you can use it for Forex market, like I showed earlier on. If we come to the COT report, sorry, um, I showed the the S, the E mini uh, S and P, but it's the same. If I want to look at the euro, then again, I can just come to the COT, um, 
to the legacy report here, but of course there are uh, other major currency pairs in here as well, including Bitcoin. Although you know that, that's not as uh, big in the futures market there, but there are you know there, there's plenty there. But I tend to just look at the likes of the dollar index and the euro uh, being the bigger bigger markets there. You could look at the Japanese yen as well, of course. So yeah, you would just click on um, Cot Legacy and that will just bring up that euro. And again, as a reminder, so if we look at what happened with the euro last week, they came out of their longs, so minus 8,000. So they were massively they were reducing their long contracts and increasing their short contracts. And so if we then come down, click off the non-reportables, click off the commercials, and we can see that overall they are reducing their exposure to the euro, which is in line with what the euro has been doing, hasn't it? And on that note, oh, there's one last question then. Um, you've been trading 25 years. Yes, that's right. I started in 1997. Maybe that's 26 years if my maths are correct. Have you ever thought about quitting and what made you move forwards? Wow. Um, the only time I thought about quitting, Adnan, was in my first year of trading when I um, blew up my first ever trading account. <laughs> I was only one year, you know, less than a year into my trading. And uh, so, yes, I blew up an account like so many traders do uh, when I first started trading. And I did think about quitting at that point. But what made me move forward was, I guess, tenacity. Um, I come from a martial arts background. I did I competed internationally at karate, funnily enough, in South Africa um, at Wembley Stadium in Johannesburg. I remember one of the um, uh, competitions we were at um, down there against the South Africans and um, against the South African national team. And at the time, we're talking late 90s here. And and so one thing that martial arts, like many um, physical endeavors, uh, taught me was not to quit. And so maybe it was that tenacity of not quitting, getting up, even if you've been kicked and beaten and you're on the floor, you get up. <laughs> so, um, and that's what happened in the markets. And I thought, do you know what? I'm not going to allow that to happen. Right. I am going to love you and leave you with just over an hour, Mark, now. Thank you ever so much for all your questions and for coming along today. There will be a recording made available to you via um uh, tick mill so much appreciated uh, tick mill inviting me to come and do these presentations uh, with them and thank you for your time today and hopefully i see some of you again soon